Good afternoon. My name is Dennis Hirsch, and I'm a professor of law at the Moritz College of Law at Ohio State. And importantly for this event, I am faculty director of the program on data and governance, uh, a program of the Moritz College of Law and also of the Translational Data Analytics Institute or TDAI at Ohio State. The program on data and governance, or as we call it, PDG, focuses on the governance of advanced analytics and AI. It has a two-part mission. First, PDG conducts research on how to maximize the benefits and reduce the threats from the use of advanced analytics and AI in our society. Second, it engages our community, the Central Ohio, Ohio State, and in this online world, national and international community in the conversation about how we can best govern advanced information technologies so that they vindicate rather than undermine our values. We do this in a number of ways, including through our data points lecture series in which you are participating today. One of the most important and controversial issues in the governance of AI is whether and how algorithmic risk assessments should be used in the criminal justice system. They are being used. Algorithms are being used to create risk assessments that inform sentencing, bail, and parole decisions, and in other areas. Some contend that these tools can provide a more accurate assessment of risk and so facilitate pretrial release and reduce the dependence on cash bail. But others maintain that the algorithmic tools are premised on, bake in and perpetuate deep racial and class inequalities and should be radically scaled down or even abandoned altogether. There's a profound need for creative in this for creative thinking in this area to resolve or perhaps transcend this debate. Our speaker today is one of the most creative academic thinkers on this topic, and she's gonna share her latest ideas with you. Jesse, Jessica Eaglin is a professor of law at the Indiana University Moore School of Law. Prior to joining Indiana, she was counsel to the justice program at the Brennan Center for Justice at the NYU New York University School of Law, where she assisted in a national campaign aimed at addressing mass incarceration in the United States. Prior to that, Professor Eaglin clerked with the Honorable Damon J. Keith of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, United States Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, and previously, Prior to that, she served as a litigation associate at Simpson Thatcher, a uh, uh, significant law firm in New York City. Professor Eaglin's research examines the expansion of technical legal practices in criminal administration as a response to the economic and social pressures of mass incarceration. She's a leading expert on algorithms in criminal sentencing. Before I turn this over to Professor Eaglin. Um, I need to let you know that we could not initiate these conversations without partners. And in particular, we could not offer the Data Points Lecture Series without the series sponsor, the law firm of Porter Wright, Morris and Arthur. We thank Porter Wright for its vision and understand the, understanding the importance of these data governance issues and for supporting this lecture series program to enhance understanding of these issues in our community. After Professor Eaglin speaks, she's gonna talk for 45 minutes or so. Uh, after she's done, there will be an opportunity for audience Q&A and I will moderate that Q&A. So please put your questions, post your questions uh, to the Q&A function uh, through Zoom and I will review them and ask as many of them as I can. It's now my great pleasure to invite Professor Eaglin to share her ideas with you. Thank you. Thank you to Dennis for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for 
the invitation uh, to speak today. And thanks to all of you out there joining us um, virtually uh, for, this, uh, for this lecture series. Uh, so today I'm gonna be talking about um, race, algorithms, and cultural imagination in criminal legal reforms. Um, in the United States, the phenomenon of mass incarceration has reached public consciousness now for almost 10 years uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, the general public is, is very aware um, that uh, the United States is one of the leading incarcerators in the world. Um, and this phenomenon, mass incarceration, refers to really two, has two features. One is the exponential increase in the size of our prison population in the United States since 1972. Um, and the second uh, is the disproportionate concentration uh, and impact of this increase in incarceration on marginalized communities of color, in particular um, uh, black and brown people from urban centers across the United States. So, since this, since this time that, that mass incarceration has reached public consciousness, a variety of criminal legal reforms have been implemented to reduce both um, or either, I should say, um, the economic or the social costs um, of mass incarceration. Among these reforms, algorithms have emerged as one of the most common um, practices to expand in the criminal legal system. So um, as Dennis mentioned, everywhere from policing uh, to pretrial bail to post-sentencing convictions um, and in the, um, in the context of um, correctional supervision and parole uh, and beyond, um, the use of algorithms is expanding and it has been quite controversial. So it's now widely recognized both empirically and sort of and normatively um, that algorithms can produce particular harms um, that will be experienced by marginalized groups um, as the tools are employed throughout the criminal legal process. Legal discourse today presents two dominant interventions concerning the challenges that algorithms present at the intersection of race and criminal legal reform. On the one hand, uh, scholars argue to, that we should tinker with either the algorithms or the law around the algorithms um, to ameliorate um, the harms that algorithms um, may present, or, um, uh, or other scholars argue that we should abolish these tools altogether, or as Dennis suggested, drastically um, reduce their use. In previous work, I have at times advocated for one or both of these stances in relation to the post-conviction sentencing context, which is um, uh, where my, uh, my primary interest lies. But in today's talk, I'm going to discuss um, our, uh, the, the, the problem that this apparent dichotomy um, is presenting. I'm gonna argue um, that this binary, right? The tinker or abolish binary um, presents a false choice in law and using race consciousness um, as a theoretical lens, I'm going to, um, I, I will demonstrate and, and argue that there's a different role for law and legal scholars uh, to play to disrupt the emergent racial thinking evident in the legal discourse around algorithms as criminal legal reform. So normatively, the, today's talk is gonna really um, make two points. And the first is that I'm going to be urging um, critical reflection on the connections between race as a way of understanding the social world and collective social action in this historical present. In other words, what is this connection between race and our cultural imagination? Um, and I argue that this, this insight, right, um, is going to, um, to give us a new perspective on the role that legal scholars play in legitimating, um, whether intentionally or not, enduring racial hierarchy through knowledge production. The second uh, uh, normative takeaway of my presentation today 
um, is, is to argue that uh, this tinkered abolished binary um, that is proposed in law um, is not the only role that law can play in contending with the racial thinking that this talk is going to reveal. So contrary to emerging scholarship, I'm urged legal scholars to shift the orientation of critique um, from either tinkering with the tools or abolition and towards a more direct critique of um, the racial assumptions that sustain the popularity of algorithms in this particular moment. And I argue that that type of disruption can occur either in the context of um, discussions about regulating algorithms or in the context of discussions about abolishing them. These, temp these takeaways um, largely connect to a broader project of mine, um, which is to argue that algorithms um, and the expansion of algorithms demonstrates a deep need for theory in, uh, in the context of criminal legal reforms going forward um, that engage with um, and challenge us to imagine a broader racial justice agenda at the intersection of race, technology, and criminal legal reforms going forward. So the talk is going to pr proceed in three parts. First, I'm going to spend a bit of time describing the insufficiency of dominant legal frameworks around algorithms as criminal legal reform. I'm then going to bring to the fore how unmarked racial assumptions in society facilitate the expansion of these algorithms in law while also entrenching racialized structural marginalization in society. Finally, I'm going to theorize on how this analysis should alter existing legal discourse and facilitate, potentially, imagining a more capacious racial justice agenda going forward. So let's begin by thinking about the shortcomings of the existing frameworks. So algorithms are everywhere, um, both within and outside criminal legal institutions. In this talk, I am focusing specifically on algorithms in criminal legal institutions, even if there is some resonance between some of the points I make and the use of algorithms in other contexts. But here in the criminal legal context, um, these data-driven tools um, are designed to standardize the prediction of an individual's likelihood of engaging in specific behavior in the future on the basis of statistical analyses of um, past offenders' behavior. And the idea is that this information that these algorithms are producing can inform and guide uh, and better inform uh, and guide individual decision makers, right? So in particular context, for example, the pretrial bail context, um, uh, decisions by judges about whether to detain um, or release an individual pretrial um, in the post-conviction context, um, uh, informing a judge or other criminal legal actors about whether to recommend and or um, sentence somebody to a term of incarceration as opposed to a term of of supervision in the community um, and other contexts um, very similarly informing criminal legal actors um, of how to make their individual decisions about um, and in connection to um, the potential for incarceration. So as I already noted, algorithms are deeply controversial um, and there are largely two frameworks that have emerged in legal scholarship um, a, about around race and algorithms within criminal legal institutions. On the one hand, scholars adopt what I refer to as an incarceration frame, where the focus is whether and how algorithms can be employed to reduce excessively uh, um, excessive reliance on incarceration in the United States. On the other hand, Scholars adopt what I refer to as a political economy of frame. I think that there are many ways you could refer to it, um, where the focus is on how algorithms expand carceral surveillance and punitive responses to social problems in the United States. Both these frames talk about race a lot. The incarceration frame 
um, largely urges adoption of algorithms um, uh, because the algorithms could reduce the threat of racial bias um, influencing individual decision makers um, in, in their determinations, among other reasons. Political economy folks, on the other hand, tend to urge abolition of these tools um, or a great scaling back of their use, at least in part because the algorithms will detrimentally affect marginalized people of color in particular. So both of these frames um, have take diametrically opposed perspectives almost on, on algorithms, um, but both are speaking a lot about but I still argue that, this, that these legal frameworks are lacking. Both the dominant frameworks tend to focus on how to address the tools. What do we do with the tools? Um, but neither frame um, meaningfully uh, critiques why we are embracing the tools as part of a path towards mass incarceration. But the path, the, the why of this path over others is critical to understanding the interplay between race and law and how, as I'll refer to it, racial thinking continues to shape existing legal discourse. It also can obscure um, um, a failure to engage with the why, critically engaging with the why of this path, um, obscures a potential role for law um, to play in intervening in this seemingly common sense technological development as part of a racial justice agenda. So what is, what is the why? You know, why do we embrace um, algorithms? Certainly, I'm not the first person to offer some suggestions. Um, and if you are familiar with any of my work, I have engaged with um, a number of the popular sort of explanations of why we are embracing algorithms um, to poke holes in them, right? To say that these explanations are not satisfactory. For example, um, a common explanation is transparency, but the algorithms themselves are often not transparent. Even the, uh, so across the United States, we have lots of different tools that are being adopted, many of which are proprietary in nature um, and uh, will not share, I mean, the, the sort of phenomenon of the black box of the algorithm um, has been widely written about. Um, and even, um, even some of the um, uh, publicly developed tools that are being used um, similarly um, have, are, are increasingly complex, right? That's part of their sort of appeal and their connection to, um, to data analytics. They're increasingly complex, not that the ones that are being used today are always complex, but they're increasingly complex um, and, re and reduce the potential for individuals to sort of, to understand how the algorithms themselves operate. Um, in the context where they are being um, employed. Another explanation is public safety. On the, at the same time, there's a lot of evidence that shows middling, um, middling um, um, outcomes in terms of public safety. So yes, it's possible that algorithms may reduce, um, may reduce crime, um, but there's also evidence, um, compelling evidence that others have compiled that say, the implementation of algorithms in, in certain states, which we have now been doing for many years, has not led to reduce uh, to reductions or cannot be an explanation for reductions in crime or in reductions in incarceration. So all these explanations, um, which are very commonly raised in the context of algorithms, are a bit tenuous. And so this paper or this talk, which is based on a paper I'm working on, um, suggests that we need to look elsewhere, that something else is also driving our embrace of algorithms, whether or not they are transparent, whether or not they are reducing crime and incarceration. And I grapple with this idea that race consciousness or racial thinking um, is, a, is, a, is a driver of our cultural imagination and our cultural embrace of algorithms in this moment. So by race consciousness, I'm referring to the racial foundation of our common sense ways of knowing the social world. In other words, the ways that our thoughts about race make certain criminal legal practices appear the right path or the preferred path in this particular moment. In the context of algorithms, 
I contend that specific racial assumptions shape our understandings of the social world in ways that make this intervention appear the common sense solution, or at least intervention um, to mass incarceration that have until this point been largely unmarked. In order to interrogate uh, the, uh, these assumptions, uh, I argue there's also a need for theory, right? Theory is what helps us to understand how and why we think the way we do. Um, and in this context, the question is not what the algorithms tell us about racial inequality per se, but what the algorithms tell us about how race continues to structure society through law in fundamental ways. In this sense, this lens that I'm, that I'm adopting um, has the ability to question um, why um, or what is the epistemological function of race and how does it and why does it spur collective social action um, while potentially, and I will argue definitively, normalizing the active reproduction of racial difference in society. So um, again, I'm, I'm grappling with the ways we think about race and society and how that constructs and shapes our understandings of the world in ways that can affect society's sort of collective willingness to accept or embrace algorithms as a solution to mass incarceration. In my current project, um, I identify three foundational racial assumptions um, necessary as preconditions to understand the legal discourse around algorithms. The first racial assumption concerns the notion of an inevitable tool and racial prejudice. So algorithms make a lot of sense as an intervention in criminal legal institutions if you believe that racial inequality is the product of irrational individual prejudices, a point that legal and policy um, driven scholarship tends to employ. But this perspective contradicts a general assertion that people also make about the idea of race altogether, which is that race is a social construct. It presumes that the individuals are being treated, that individuals are being treated differently on the basis of race, and so the algorithms can neutralize that, that different treatment, rather than that race has shaped the lived experience of people through various institutions and the algorithms and their predictive factors reflect those disparate experiences. So I contend that race consciousness explains this dissonance, right? The dissonance between um, sort of believing that race is a social construct on the one hand, and also believing that racial inequality is the product of individual irrational prejudice. And what's interesting in this context, um, I argue, is that the assumption actually concerns white people, not black people, which is what most of the scholarship focuses on in this moment. And it's the idea that white people are intractable to change um, on the basis of race that lends credence to the adoption of interventions that control individual actors through um, divine interventions, um, despite this common assertion that race is a social construct. So at this point, it's helpful to take a step back and think about racial thinking in historical context. In his 1971 book, The Black Image in the White Mind, uh, George Fredrickson unpacked a variety of racial assumptions that shaped post-slavery United States. One such assumption concerned white people. Namely, that white Americans' racial antipathies are permanent and, quote, too deep to be eradicated, and importantly, quote, removable only through divine agency. This ra racial assumption um, led to enthusiasm in the, uh, in the um, uh, uh, sort of uh, moment before slavery was, uh, and, and when slavery was, um, uh, abolished enthusiasm for a particular policy intervention, 
the removal of Black people from the United States after slavery. It, it, while this solution was not successful, clearly, um, it demonstrates um, a, a commitment, an epistemological commitment to divine interventions or what is perceived as or understood as divine interventions because of race. And this, res this thinking resonates now in the context of algorithms. In criminal legal reform, I contend that race gives data-driven predictive aspects of algorithmic tools moral authority precisely because Prediction um, with, uh, with large data sets um, and um, more, more powerful algorithms um, is understood to be something that is beyond human capacity. Further, race gives moral authority to the belief that such divine intervention, right, the information that algorithms themselves, uh, that, that algorithms produce, can control individuals. So, this racial thinking compels society towards common social action, the embrace of algorithms in criminal legal institutions. It creates a positive association with the tools, regardless if those tools and the criminal legal practices using those tools achieve other ends like reducing crime, like reducing incarceration. So though no one would say that algorithms have been employed perfectly, I argue that the seemingly divine nature of the tools themselves gives them a particular cachet as a response to mass incarceration because of our own racial thinkings. This assumption benefits white people in this historical present. It legitimates investment in technologies over investment in structural reforms, such as, for example, investment in the welfare state, something that political economy folks would, would point out um, frequently. Um, yet the welfare state, not individual technologies, has the potential to ameliorate material inequalities that lock in benefits for white people over time while disadvantaging non-white people in the United States today. So it's important to mark here what makes my intervention different from political economy folks. Most critics have, have identified this impulse towards sort of um, what David Garland, for example, has called the culture of control. But none, to my knowledge, have really thought about what is it about this culture of control that connects to racial thinking. And it illuminates that we are compelled by, right, um, to social action through our racial thinking. So the second assumption concerns the, the notion that algorithms are a costless solution in the face of mass incarceration. Scholars and policy advocates frequently presume that algorithms are a relatively costless intervention um, compared to the significant spending um, that as often unpacked in the discourse, the legal discourse around algorithms that, um, in relation to the carceral state. So for example, you will often see algorithms as a solution that is offered in response to a discussion of the costs of incarceration compared to, for example, the cost of alternative sanctions that can be facilitated through algorithms, other um, alternative sanctions like diversion programs in the pretrial and the post-conviction um, context. Such comparisons are often um, launched as a reason to adopt these algorithms. Yet the algorithms themselves cost a lot materially and epistemologically. So from tool construction to tool governance to altering the very administration of criminal law, um, these tools are costly and law facilitates their so, the social investment in these algorithms as part of a collective path in response to mass incarceration. For example, that law in, since the 1990s has, it has facilitated a broad investment in the production of criminal justice data. Uh, it has incentivized the creation of criminal justice data in the states, um, the federal, uh, government has um, spent a lot of money on, in, on incentivizing 
the courts, incentivizing other criminal legal institutions to produce data that can be um, processed, uh, particularly for, not necessarily particularly for, but processed in a way that is, is commonly used um, to access the data for algorithms now. Um, and similarly has, in, has incentivized um, the creation of legal infrastructure around algorithmic government, governance as well. So um, in addition to that, I've written um, in the past about the way that our expectations about what judges do at sentencing in the post-conviction sentencing context, for example, has shifted quite a bit. Um, in response to or alongside the development of, um, of algorithms and the, the popularity of algorithms, we now expect judges to have a much more formalistic understanding or analysis um, of particular measurable factors at sentencing in comparison to the more common sort of passing of moral judgment um, that existed prior to um, prior to the creation of, for example, sentencing guidelines um, and, and the sort of long history towards um, algorithms. But in this, in this context, my point really isn't that this is good or bad. It's that little scholarship critiques these costs um, and race consciousness provides a lens to understand this relative silence as well. It is the assumption that technology should be the way to respond to racial inequality that makes these costs invisible. And my point is not that we should be spending money in other ways, not to say that we should never try to, to invest in um, algorithmic governance, rather it's to illuminate that racial thinking, our race consciousness, operates as an unspoken foundation for the depoliticization of certain allocations of resources in society. In other words, it is an example of how race continues to structure our social world. This, this assumption, the costless solution, um, in connection um, in particular with the previous assumption about racial prejudice, um, locks in white privilege in society. Um, the technocratic frame reinforces cultural assumptions about black people as dangerous or non-law abiding um, or some version of that, because I think um, you know, being high risk means something slightly different from dangerousness. Um, it forecloses, and this, this is, these are points that others have made as well, that it forecloses marginalized groups ability to govern criminal laws administration. It produces a hierarchy of knowledge and it can prevent more transformational bottom-up um, interventions in various spaces, for example, the pretrial bill context. It can also reduce public pressure to change controversial um, sentencing laws in the post-conviction um, context. So together with the prior assumption, we see the ways that this belief, this um, benevolent, often benevolent belief that algorithms um, can and are addressing um, race in a way that resonates with our cultural imagination are in fact reproducing structural marginalization in society. So this leads me to my final point, um, which is this assumption. So the third assumption um, is this idea that race itself is fixed um, and the very meaning of race in society. So building from these other two assumptions, a legal discourse is developing around what to do about race in relation to algorithmic um, tools expansion. So for example, tools today, the popular tools used um, today do not consider race explicitly. And a discourse is developing that questions or suggests that it is an open question whether law should or could permit such consideration. These claims are often launched through a clearly benevolent discourse. That is, when faced with evidence that the tools will disproportionately impact marginalized people of color due to structural realities in society, a debate has emerged about quote unquote algorithmic discrimination. And there's basically two camps. Those that say considering race can ameliorate harm um, in the algorithms and constitutional law should get out of the way. Um, and those who say that race will exacerbate the harm and constitutional law does or should prevent such consideration. 
In this talk, I'm not going to stake a claim about which of these paths is the correct path. Rather, using race consciousness as a theoretical lens, I contend that this legal discourse illuminates a prevalent racial assumption that race is fixed, permanent, and capable of measurement. This assumption reduces race to skin color, something that can be identified and measured um, and, and verified, illuminating again, a contradiction between the assertion that race is a social construct or a human creation um, and the way people act in society. So for those urging that we do not consider race in the algorithm, um, this assumption is reflected by the notion that race is fixed and cannot be changed and so it should not be considered um, and it would be wrong to, um, to punish somebody or to, um, uh, to, pu uh, to, uh, to take away their liberty um, uh, on such a basis. But among those considering um, urging consideration of race and algorithms, um, this assumption is reflected um, in the idea that at the state or private actor can see and then unsee race for society by determining through data collection who is and is not of a particular race. This assumption that race is fixed is not new. It was found, it's the foundation upon which a biological conception of race has operated. And critical race theorists for a long time have, I, have explained the ways that this kind of thinking naturalizes um, inequality in the United States. And my point here um, is to suggest that there's a continuity, not to say that, that um, this discourse reflects biological um, racism itself, but there's a continuity here in our ways of thinking about race and our current understandings of it. That is, this discourse illuminates um, that our understanding of race itself, though not precisely biological, remains biocentric. And in conceptualizing race as fixed, these, this way of knowing can insulate white privilege and non-white disadvantage as natural and or beyond legal and policy interventions. So for example, it's the belief that we are all inherently different that can normalize the fact that some people experience the criminal legal um, institutions quite differently. Uh, and so in this way, we see again, the way that our, the way that, that race connects to our cultural imagination, right? Um, that we already understand race in this biocentric way um, and that that in turn can contribute to and reproduce structural marginalization along racial lines. So going forward, what does this analysis get us? I contend that this lens, this theoretical lens, um, provides new insight to the ways that race continues to shape um, our, the way that race continues to shape the social world through a particular way of knowing, right? That it has this epistemological function. Um, and that this, that recognizing this, identifying this sort of connection between race's epistemological function um, and our cultural imagination around criminal legal reforms in this moment um, can shape and inform a different agenda for legal scholars as we continue to think about how to push towards racial justice in this moment. So, um, to this point about this theoretical lens, much scholarship, um, critical legal theorists uh, and others have recognized that racial thinking is not stagnant, that it is constantly changing. And this, this project sort of takes a look at what we think is common sense as a way to then change the lens and say, well, what does that tell us about race? And potentially, what does that tell us about what critical race theorists have called um, racial ideology. So um, the sort of common understanding of, of racial ideology in the United States is that up until, uh, you know, up until about the civil rights, uh, the moment of the civil rights movement, um, the dominant racial ideology in the United States was domination um, uh, or white, excuse me, white supremacy. And that after that time period, 
we move to a space of, um, of domination through ideological notions, particularly racial ideology, which in the context of criminal law um, has been demonstrated to really reflect um, uh, an impulse to understand criminal legal practices as non-racial in all contexts. And what I, what, what I point out in this paper and in this talk today is that actually we're very much race conscious, right? We're, and, and, and explicitly so, both sort of frameworks around algorithms are engaging with and talking about race um, quite directly. Um, however, I think that this illuminates for us that as we that we are moving to a different type of racial ideology. Um, other scholars have, have written about post-racial racial ideology, which is supposed to uh, connote a, a commitment to racial transcendence and non-racial terms, things like talking about fairness rather than talking about racial justice. Um, and what I think this, this thinking about algorithms tells us is that at least in the criminal legal context, if we are in this moment of post-racial racial, racialism, that it operates slightly differently. And that here in this context, we are selectively race conscious, right? We're selectively very race conscious. We're, we're very concerned. I think that there's a, a broad consideration of the racial aspect of mass incarceration in thinking about when and why we should be reforming criminal legal practices. However, we are still resistant to thinking about the ways that we proactively um, and continuously reproduce structural marginalization along racial lines and the ways that the criminal legal apparatus is central to that reproduction. So this tells us, or at least it, it invites us to think with, with a different lens, not about the, you know, not really about the algorithms themselves, or even the law around the algorithms, but instead to say what we need to be challenging or uh, what we need to be engaging with is this connection between race and our cultural imagination and, and contending that it's our, that, that um, unpacking sort of the connections between algorithms um, and, uh, and, and criminal legal reforms helps to invite us to do that. But seeing it, right, is not, the only thing that law can do, right? Legal scholars may spend time illuminating it, but I think what's really necessary is to shift the discourse a bit um, and, and thinking more about revealing racial assumptions of which I, in this talk I've identified three and the way those racial assumptions are shaping our social world. And then I think we can do that within the legal discourse around algorithms. And so here we go, we come back full circle to this point that I raised at the beginning of the talk, which is that, you know, part of this project has been trying to make sense of my own impulse to, um, to both critique and, and, you know, suggest ways that law should intervene in the regulation of algorithms, along with urging abolition of algorithms um, in particular contexts as part of this broader sort of social justice, racial justice agenda. And I think that this theoretical lens gives an insight to why I could, why I could sort of come to both of these conclusions, right? That, that we need to be fighting um, against sort of this connection between race and cultural imagination on both fronts. And it's not by ignoring race, but it is instead by, by confronting our, our enduring racial consciousness and that law can be a particular means to do that. And so, um, in, in the project I'm working on now, I sort of think about what does that mean? Um, and I think part of it is in the discourse, the discourse, the legal discourse around algorithms, spending more time um, revealing the sort of contradictions or the, um, uh, the racial assumptions that are underlying the way that we think about algorithms. Um, and we can do that in both contexts. Um, and so shifting from a focus on sort of what the law should do and focusing uh, or, or how the algorithm should be designed and instead focusing on asking questions about why we think what we think. Um, so uh, I think that, that that about wraps it up. I'm really excited for, um, for engagement with all of you. So I'm looking forward to the Q&A and I, I will turn it back over to Dennis.
Well, thank you, Jessica, for a really interesting and stimulating presentation. Um, I know it's got me thinking, and it's got a number of questions going in my mind. Uh, I want to invite members of the audience to ask questions as well, simply by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your page there and posting your question. Um, and uh, I'll keep track of them. Uh, Jessica also may look at them and, and, and will be able to, um, to address them. Let me, while we're getting some questions in the Q&A, um, Jessica, let me start with a question of my own. Uh, so let's engage in a bit of cultural imagination here. If we were not relying on the deus ex machina, you know, algorithm to come in and make everything fair and objective for us and, you know, address the inequalities in the system, you know, you talk about improvements to the social welfare system, you talk about ground up in interventions. What other types of interventions, initiatives, changes, would you like us to start thinking about? Would you like to include in our imaginations beyond simply, you know, the, the algorithmic solution? Thanks. So, you know, I think that that's a, it's a hard question. That's, you know, that's basically a, a whole research agenda for the next, <laughs> for the next five to 10 years. Um, I, I and, it, and it's one I think about a lot, you know, um, Scholars have sort of written, I, I, one thing I, I want to clarify is, you know, the welfare state was not perfect. Um, it was, it was problematic and, and, um, and, and had its own role to play in sort of reproducing and creating um, inequality in the United States. And so I don't think that it's enough to just say, hey, let's, let's just start investing in the welfare state um, full stop. But I do think that it reflected sort of a, a impulse to invest in institutions of care as opposed to institutions of, um, of, of punishment that, you know, many of the political economy folks would say like is, is central sort of to, the, to our understanding of um, the sort of governmental structures that we have today. Um, and so I think that's an important step. And, and you know, it, it does require imagining something different. Um, and I, I'm not sure that I have sort of a satisfying answer. I mean, I think part of it is, you know, about really being willing to explore things that, that sort of seem counterintuitive to us. Um, and I've written very recently sort of uh, about the defund the police um, debate. And what fascinates me about it is the way that sort of the, the debate itself um, was shaped by, I mean, everybody, almost ev almost everyone had like a genuine concern about race, right? Like we can't defund the police. It would be, it would harm, you know, racial minorities or, or we should defund the police because it will benefit racial minorities. And I think that it also illuminates the ways that we, we are resistant to thinking about enacting change on multiple uh, avenues at the same time. So in the article, I just sort of talk about, you know, like one, one way to do it is, is through, you know, abolition. I think that that's part of it, um, you know, and trying to scale back the carceral state. But I also think that there are a lot of ways that the institutions that we have right now could be um, employed to facilitate and to redress structural marginalization. Um, and I think of the work of, of others um, thinking about sort of the way policing, Monica Bell, for example, has written about the way policing could be um, a, a tool to reduce um, residential segregation in the United States. And, you know, and so um, I see my contribution here is saying, you know, I think that we can imagine work that algorithms could do potentially in that context, but we can't begin to imagine that until we understand how algorithms are resonating with and operating within sort of um, our own racial assumptions. So the question, uh, the first question we have is that in my presentation, I mentioned how US law can, um, has been incentivizing algorithms in a variety of ways. And I emphasize particularly from the 1990s on, um, and can I give some examples? Happy to do it. So. First of all, I should say it didn't start in the 90s, right? There's a lot of work, um, for example, um, the historian Elizabeth Hinton um, talked a lot about um, what's called uh, the LEAA, the Law Enforcement um, Assistant, Assistance Administration that operated 
um, in the 1960s uh, and into the 1970s um, that really incentivized the like quote unquote modernization of, of criminal legal institutions. Um, and part of that um, was subsidizing, the, literally the government was subsidizing federal, state and local uh, investment in technology more broadly. And so that's sort of th that kind of funding, for example, I've written in the past about how that particular funding gave us the sentencing guidelines. Um, and in recent years, um, a, a sort of new iteration, uh, it's, it's certainly not the same thing, but it's, it's, it's a spinoff of, of what what sort of developed in the wake of the LEAA's um, uh, you know, dissolution has been the Justice Reinvestment Initiative. Um, and so Justice Reinvestment Initiative is this private, public-private um, initiative that is partially subsidized by the federal government. And then you have buy-in from, um, from state actors or for state governments as well and private actors um, to um, promote uh, technical interventions to manage prison populations. And one of the primary um, interventions, technical interventions that they have endorsed has been, um, you know, not very complex, but algorithmic um, risk assessments in various spaces. So those, you know, the, the um, uh, justice reinvestment really, uh, you know, came to the fore in the, in the 2000s. Um, but then in addition to that, um, we have a lot of examples of, you know, what I really was thinking about in, in making that statement is are the ways that the law makes creation of algorithms cheap. Um, so, um, for example, um, 1995, Congress uh, financially incentivized states and localities to automate their criminal record systems through the National Criminal History Improvement Program. Uh, in 1996, we have the Electronic Freedom of Information Act that further encouraged governments to um, use new technologies um, to enhance public access to agencies, um, uh, agency records and information. And these are just two examples of, you know, it's, it's a space that is not, we don't think about it as connected to criminal legal reform, but what it's done is create sort of a foundation for the infrastructure to build algorithms. So technically they are actually, you know, this data can be very cheap to access, um, but it's cheap to access because, or, or I should say the data that is commonly used in algorithms, things like criminal records um, are cheap to access because government made them cheap. Mute. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, that's better, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, another question from the audience. Um, there's been a push on the state and federal level into algorithmic transparency and accountability policy, mostly for commercial social platforms, kind of on the commercial side. Do you see or predict similar algorithmic transparency and accountability policies within government agencies for criminal justice? And I'll tack on to that. Do you see that ha as having important implications for due process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I, I've been giving some thought to this. I certainly, it's something, um, so to briefly, to quickly answer the question, yes, we are beginning to see um, similar sort of movements towards algorithmic transparency and accountability um, in the public sector more broadly and in certain, certain states and localities, particularly in the context of criminal, um, criminal legal institutions. So um, I, I hesitate to say which, which city it is, but I know that in California, um, one or two cities um, have passed legislation, um, you know, at the local level ordinances that say basically we, we are not going to use algorithms that don't have, um, uh, that, that lack certain, certain sort of features of transparency. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, certainly among legal scholars, there's been a real um, push towards encouraging more, um, more of those kinds of interventions. In fact, um, you know, I have um, suggested some of that as well to say, you know, there are ways that, that um, we might imagine law um, intervening into and facilitating um, certain types of transparency and accountability. Um, and, and we're starting to see them. <laughs> 
Now, you know, to this to the second part of this question that, that Dennis adds on, which is, you know, do we see what do what do you think that that means for, for example, due process? I mean, um, there's a lot of interesting scholarship that suggests, you know, look, the ways that we guarantee due process are going to change along with algorithms. Um, you know, the algorithms due process basically isn't going to um, uh, uh, we can't guarantee due process the same way we did in a, in a government sort of infrastructure that does not operate the same way, right? It changes and so we change with it. And, and I think that, um, you know, my intervention there is that, there, that these, these moments, right, where we're talking about, you know, there's like a, a broad sort of critique that there's a lack of transparency or that, the, that this lack of transparency and accountability can lead to due process concerns are also opportunities to think about why we are doing this um, that I think can sometimes get lost in the discourse about sort of what to do. Um, and, and, you know, and I think that it, the challenge for legal scholars is in part um, to find ways to sort of shift um, the focus along with sort of our like impulse to fix um, you know, but also to shift the focus to ask these questions of, you know, why are we doing this? What does it mean if we're doing this? And how are the people who are, you know, going to be most affected by these tools going to be impacted um, if we move in this direction without critical reflection? Thank you. It's really interesting. Um, another question from our audience, Jessica. Uh, in some cases, perhaps in many cases, policy and regulations are not computationally or mathematically feasible. What are your thoughts on how to recognize, reconcile policy requirements for computation and data with their implementation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, I take that question, um, you know, it's sort of getting at this, this sort of increasingly visible tension in the, in the discourse on algorithms, which is like, you know, is law, you know, capable basically of grappling with the complexity of um, these deeply technical, you know, mathematically driven um, algorithms and, and how do we sort of bridge that divide? Um, and I think a lot of it really comes back to, to discourse, to, to definitions, to concepts, um, which are, you know, I think, of course, I would say this legal scholars are really well situated to engage with. Um, but, you know, part of what I see in, in this project, you know, one of the places that I ended in this project is, is saying, you know, sort of what are the questions, like what are the words that we grapple with and what are the words that we take for granted? Um, and I think that, you know, for example, this whole discourse around algorithmic discrimination has really produced some interesting questions about what discrimination means. Um, but, it also is taking for granted, I, I what I argue in this project, it's taking for granted what racial ideology means, right? Like, what does it mean to think, what does it mean to think about race um, or for race to continue to sort of shape our, our social action um, that we either don't have the words for or the words have sort of been, you know, sort of coalesced into, into public discourse in ways that don't have the same meaning. So for example, um, in the algorithmic di um, discrimination discourse, there's this like sort of like lay parlance now that you know the debate is really between people who want colorblind um, risk assessments versus you know I guess race conscious risk assessments, and I find that so fascinating because now we're using the term colorblind, which when I use the term or when I see the term, I think is really talking about sort of um, like racial thinking and um, and the way that it sort of you know reinforces um, inequality, but actually this very technical use of the term is is I mean it's like it's literally colorblind like like do we want it to not have race in the consideration or not? And so trying to bridge that divide to say, hey, like these words have like multiple layers of meaning, um, I think is a really important um, aspect of sort of beginning to think about sort of the work that even, you know, deeply technical, um, computationally or mathematically 
um, technical interventions are still relying on. Like these tools are built with our own social concepts of the world. Thanks. Um, we have a question, Jessica, about a case that I imagine you're aware of, Loomis versus Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And for members of our audience, that's a case that went to the Wisconsin Supreme Court in which a criminal defendant challenged the use of algorithmic um, risk assessment in his case, mm -hmm. a number of allegations, one being that, they dis that the algorithm discriminated against him as a man, as I recall. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it led the Wisconsin Supreme Court to develop some policies for Wisconsin judges when using these algorithms. What are your thoughts about Loomis versus Wisconsin? Yeah, thank you for that question. So it's such a fascinating case. Um, and you know, I think it's actually a good example of, of what I'm sort of what I'm talking about in my presentation today. So in the case, um, the court is sort of grappling with. I mean, as, as Dennis suggested, right, there's a number of issues that it's a proprietary tool, the compass tool um, that's being used. Um, that tool actually wasn't designed for sentencing, even though that's the context that it was being used in. Um, and, you know, there's this sort of empirical component to the debate about, you know, does this disproportionately, um, you know, harm on the, along the lines of race, but also along the lines of gender. And, and, and it's the gender component that is, is really the strongest sort of argument um, in that case. And the response that the court had was you can use the tools. I mean, and if you know anything about sentencing, like there's very low evidentiary standard in sentencing. Um, there's very little sort of regulation of information that comes in in the sentencing context. Um, and they, they say, you know, based on that basically, um, you can use the information, um, but whenever these compass tools are being used at sentencing, we're going to attach these, you know, four, four, four to six, I can't remember how many it is, uh, warnings. And one of those warnings concerns that, you know, there's evidence that suggests that this is going to have, you know, um, racially disparate impacts. And um, some of the other warnings concern, you know, that these tools weren't made for sentencing, et cetera, et cetera. But what fascinates me about this case and the, 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 the decision is that there's absolutely no discussion of structural marginalization in the case whatsoever. Um, and so the way, it, to me, it's this really great example of the way that our expectations about what judges think about at sentencing has really altered, um, where we're not really asking judges to pass judgment in social context. Um, we are instead asking judges to think about sort of formal uh, mechanistic factors of which risk has emerged as one, you know, um, uh, prominent factor. Um, and so I, in, in, in a previous project or a recent project, um, uh, population-based sentencing, it came out in the Cornell Law Review in 2021. Um, I actually spent some time talking about how could the court have talked about this case in a different way that would illuminate sort of the structural components that contribute to um, sort of the impact that the algorithms themselves have potentially along gender lines um, and along racial lines as well. And, you know, in that case, for example, the, the case doesn't even tell you that the defendant is white, which is a very common feature of sort of normalizing white privilege. It's like, if you don't say what the race is, then you assume that this person doesn't have one and not having one is being white, although whiteness is a race just like everything else. Um, so, you know, one place to start is to, is to say that, you know, but another place to start is to, is to recognize um, that this defendant had, um, you know, longstanding um, evidence of addiction that did not come up and, and, and that actually the state of Wisconsin um, has widespread shortages in access to care institutions um, that can offer um, um, the exact kind of services that it sounded like this defendant needed before he ever even ended up in the criminal justice system, um, or certainly in the instance that led him to this case. But it's also about, you know, sort of saying like, so in that context, should, how do we pass moral judgment? I'm not saying that that's easy. And I don't necessarily know that that would change a judge's, an individual judge's sentence outcome. Of course, in this case, the defendant actually had 
a pretty significant punishment for um, um, for the crime of conviction, um, although there were some underlying circumstances of, of other um, offenses that were being taken into consideration. But I think it illuminates this, this sort of um, pivot that I'm urging from a theoretical perspective um, in my current project, which is to say, we've got to find a way to think about our social context, um, even though algorithms really invite us to go to this very technical um, abstract place. And I think judges can do it just as much as we as legal scholars, we as policymakers um, can do it, but it really takes a, like an intentional um, you know, effort to, to resist sort of the, the surface level uh, engagement that algorithms can invite. I mean, I think you just said two, at least two really interesting things. One, this idea of kind of looking at to the addiction services, looking at the addiction service side of this picture, I'm understanding correctly about what you're, correctly the way you're talking about cultural imagination. That's an example of that, to kind of broaden the lens, if you will, to, to think about these other features that that lead to incarceration or can prevent incarceration. So that, that's interesting. And also you're talking about kind of a shift in what we're asking judges to do from assessing social context and thinking about what just so, what would be socially just in the context to thinking about you know, what's accurate, what's, what's an accurate risk assessment or not. And that even if judges don't do the you know, social justice uh, perfectly, right? Um, and, and there's lots of issues with that. That shift in, in what we're asking judges to do with the introduction of algorithms is an interesting one. I hadn't thought about that in quite that way. I think, I think that's right. That leads me to kind of a last question, Jessica, and one that's related to my own research. Um, if you could, you know, uh, make some changes to the ways that judges do um, assess, process, use, think about these algorithms. I know that the Loomis court issued these recommendations, these warnings. Um, what would you want to change? You know, let's say short of abolition of the, of the algorithms, they're gonna be part of our system. What would you want them, what would you, how would you want judges to treat them differently or how would you want the system to, to utilize them differently? Yeah, I mean, you know, short, short answer is, is, is in line with what I just said about Loomis. Like, I'd love to see judges looking at algorithms and not thinking about the accuracy sort of as a contained thing. Um, you know, are these algorithms accurate? But instead asking this question that, that I don't think we can ask without some transparency in the tools themselves, um, you know, what are these, what are these algorithms telling us? Like, what are they reflecting about society and how can we start to sort of bring those, those, you know, um, features to the fore and potentially critique them, right? So, you know, uh, in the example of, um, you know, Loomis, it's like, well, so what are the dominant, you know, factors that, that sort of led to uh, his, his, you know, high risk assessment? You know, some of them are criminal history. How, why, why is, you know, like, how do people get criminal history records in Wisconsin? You know, what, like, what is this sort of background that leads us to this place, um, you know, that, and like, if you can unpack them, so like the algorithms are trying to like, you know, condense them, but if we unpack them and we start to think about like, like these things tell us about sort of lived experience, um, you know, then they're not, they're not any better or worse than, than, um, you know, some other tools that have been introduced, but that's a major, you know, um, sort of epistemological, frankly, you know, shift in thinking about what it is that judges, what do we value judges as doing at sentencing, um, and, and certainly in other contexts as well. So, but that I think is a place to start. Well, and it's also a really uh, nice note to end on. So we're at the end of our time. Um, thanks to our audience uh, for joining us today, and especially thanks to uh, Professor Jennifer, Jessica, I'm sorry, Jessica Eaglin um, for uh, sharing all her interesting ideas with us today. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you. Okay. Have a great Bye. day.